Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are once again going to be continuing to read The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. And we are definitely getting close to the end. Uh, we won't, we're unlikely to be able to finish it today, so it's likely to be that tomorrow we finish The Wind in the Willows. So, let's get started. What? cried Toad, dismayed. Me stop indoors and write a lot of rotten letters on a jolly morning like this, when I want to go around my property and set everything and everybody to rights and swagger about and enjoy myself? Certainly not. I'll be... I'll see you. Stop a minute, though. Why, of course, dear Badger. What is my pleasure or convenience compared with that of others? You wish it done and it shall be done. Go, Badger, order the banquet. Order what you like, then join our young friends outside in their innocent mirth, oblivious of me and my cares and toils. I sacrifice this fair morning on the altar of duty and friendship. The badger looked at him very suspiciously, but Toad's frank and open countenance made it difficult to suggest any unworthy motive in this change of attitude. He quitted the room, accordingly, in the direction of the kitchen and as soon as the door had closed behind him, Toad hurried to the writing table. A fine idea had occurred to him while he was talking. He would write the invitations, and he would take care to mention the leading part he, like leading part he had taken in the fight, and how he had laid the chief weasel flat, and he would hint at his adventures, and what a career of triumph he had to tell about. And on the flyleaf, he would set out a sort of a program of entertainment for the evening. <clears throat> Something like this, as he sketched it out in his head. Speech by Toad There will be other speeches by Toad during the evening. Address by Toad Synopsis Our prison system, the waterways of old England, horse dealing and how to deal. Property, its rights and its duties. Back to the land. A Typical English Squire Song by Toad Composed by himself Other compositions by Toad Will be sung in the course of the evening by the composer. The idea pleased him mightily, and he worked very hard and got all the letters finished by noon, at which hour it was reported to him that there was a small and rather bedraggled weasel at the door inquiring timidly whether he could be of any service to the gentleman. Toad swaggered out and found it was one of the prisoners of the previous evening, very respectful and anxious to please. He patted him on the head, shoved the bundle of invitations into his paw, and told him to cut along quick and deliver them as fast as he could, and if he liked to come back again in the evening, perhaps there might be a shilling for him, or again perhaps there mightn't, and the poor weasel seemed really quite grateful, and hurried off eagerly to do his mission. When the other animals came back to luncheon, very boisterous and breezy after a morning on the river, the mole whose conscience had been prickling him, sorry, pricking him, looked doubtfully at Toad, expecting to find him sulky or dis depressed. Instead, he was so uppish and inflated that the mole began to suspect something, while the rat and the badger exchanged significant glances. As soon as the meal was over, Toad thrust his paws deep into his trouser pockets, remarked casually, well, look after yourselves, you fellows, ask for anything you want, and was swaggering off in the direction of the garden, where he, want <clears throat> where he wanted to think out an idea or two for his coming speeches, when the rat caught him by the arm. Toad rather suspected what he was after, and did his best to get away. But when the badger took him firmly by the other arm, he began to see that the game was up. The two animals conducted him between them into a small smoking room that opened out of the entrance hall, shut the door, and put him into a chair. Then they both stood in front of him, while Toad sat silent and regarded them with much suspicion and ill humour. Now, look here, Toad, said the rat. It's about this banquet. And very sorry I am to have to speak to you like this. But we want you to understand clearly, once and for all, 
that there are going to be no speeches and no songs. Try and grasp that the fact that on this occasion we're not arguing with you. We're just telling you. Toad saw that he was trapped. They understood him. They saw through him. They had got ahead of him. His pleasant dream was shattered. Mayn't I sing them just one little song, he pleaded piteously. No, not one little song, replied the rat firmly, though his heart bled as he noticed the trembling lip of the poor disappointed Toad. It's no good, Toady. You know well that your songs are all conceit and boasting and vanity, and your speeches are all self-praise and, and, well, and gross exaggeration and, and, and gas, put in the badger, in his common way. It's for your own good, Toady, went on the rat. You know you must turn over a new leaf sooner or later, and now seems a splendid time to begin. A sort of turning point in your career. Please don't think that saying all this doesn't hurt me more than it hurts you. Toad remained a long while plunged in thought. At last he raised his head, and the traces of strong emotion were visible on his features. You have conquered, my friends, he said in broken accents. It was, to be sure, but a small thing that I asked. Merely to leave a blossom and expand for yet one more evening. To let myself go and hear the tumultuous applause that always seems to me, somehow, to bring out my best qualities. However, you are right, I know, and I am wrong. Henceforth I will be a very different toad. My friends, you shall never have occasion to blush for me again. But... Oh dear, oh dear, this is a hard world. And, pressing his handkerchief to his face, he left the room with faltering footsteps. Badger, said the rat, I feel like a brute. I wonder what you feel like. Oh, I know, I know, said the badger gloomily. But the thing had to be done. This good fellow has got to live here and hold his own and be respected. Would you have him a common laughingstock, mocked and jeered at by stoats and weasels? Of course not, said the rat. And talking of weasels, it's lucky we came upon that little weasel, just as he was setting out with Toad's invitations. I suspected something from what you told me, and had a look at one or two. It was simply disgraceful. I confiscated the lot, and the good mole is now sitting in the blue boudoir, filling up plain, simple invitation cards. At last the hour for the banquet begin, began to draw near, and Toad, who on leaving the others had retired to his bedroom, was still sitting there, melancholy and thoughtful, his brow resting on his paw. He pondered long and deeply. Gradually his countenance cleared, and he began to smile long, slow smiles. Then he took to giggling in a shy, self-conscious manner. At last he got up, locked the door, drew the curtains across the windows, collected all the chairs in the room and arranged them in a semicircle, and took up his position in front of them, swelling visibly. Then he bowed, coughed twice, and, letting himself go, with uplifted voice he sang to the enraptured audience that his imagination so clearly saw. Toad's Last Little Song The toad came home. There was panic in the parlours and bowling in the halls. There was crying in the cowsheds and shrieking in the stalls. When the toad came home. When the toad came home. They were smashing in of window and crashing in of door. They were shivying of weasels that fainted on the floor. When the toad came home. Bango the drums, the trumpeters are tooting and the soldiers are saluting. And the cannon they are shooting and the motor cars are hooting as the hero comes. Shout hooray and let each one of the crowd try and shout it very loud, in honour of an animal of whom you're just justly proud, for it's Toad's great day. He sang this very loud with great unction and expression, and when he had done he sang it all over again. Then he heaved a deep sigh, a long, long sigh. Then he dipped his hairbrush in the water jug, parted his hair in the middle, 
and plastered it down very straight and sleek on each side of his face, and, unlocking the door, went quietly down the stairs to greet his guests, who he knew must be assembling in the drawing room. And with that, we come to the end of the episode. <clears throat> um, um, I've forgotten what I normally say at the end of an episode, weirdly. Uh, something along the lines of... Um, I hope you have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, or night. Oh no, thank you very much for joining me tonight. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.